So the topic that we will be covering today is CDM. Um, it stands for Construction Design Management Regulation, which applies to all of you here, those who are involved in construction-related field. And in a while, we'll be looking at what does construction-related field mean. Some of you have attended the uh, 2007 version, so let's look at how is it different now. Why, why did we have to introduce this 2015 regulation? What I have is, if I would strongly suggest that you may want to refer to the guidance to CDM 2015, which is, if you can take note of this, L153. That is a legal document uh, produced by the HSC, L153 CDM guidance on the regulation. So as you know, the act is different to regulation, so this is regulation and under that we have a guidance. And there are various sections and paragraphs to CDM 2015. Uh, there are five parts and they are scheduled in short appendix um, covering on various topics. Um, so it could be about notification, uh, it could be about welfare facilities, which is scheduled through. Uh, schedule 3 is about particular risk and so on and so forth. So let's start people. The key thing that a lot of people are having their head um, a bit confused is the two big words, which is application and notify, notification. So the first one is application, meaning where does CDM apply? The answer to that is every job. Previously, 2007, it did not cover domestic. Now. Even domestic work, CDM 2015 applies. So every job that you are undertaking, then, which is you guys in the construction industry, applies. The other distinction is notification. Certain projects you have to notify to HSC. Yeah, big projects, and we'll come into that. So that is a big distinction. First one is, where does it apply? Every construction related activity. Second thing is notifications. HSE just needs to be notified about some big ones. We'll cover in, in that in a while. So let's look at the application. Where does CDM apply? All type of job, whether it's commercial or domestic, starting looking at, for example, it could be building engineering work or construction work, which you guys are all involved with. It could be some alteration, repairs, painting and decoration, some maintenance work, for example. If you can look at what we saw earlier, CDM applies in every kind of uh, activities. So, for example, if the work is, looks like a construction work, requires construction skill, using construction material, then it is considered as construction work. So let me look at, for example, you are coming to my grandmother's house, you've been calling to change the uh, there's a dripping tap, yeah? So the washer's gone off and you are the plumbers, you come over to repair or replace the washer. Yeah, it's a dripping tap. Do you think it is a construction work? It is, yeah? As you can see, it is a construction required, skills is required, you're using construction material and it is, falls within that route. Well, as general maintenance, for example, if you have your fire extinguisher engineers coming and then re maintaining your fire extinguishers, then CDM doesn't apply. Yeah, but generally you can see that construction, uh, most construction activity falls within CDM. Now, what I would like to introduce is the duties. There are few duty holders or responsible people mentioned in CDM 2015. The key thing is the client. You may be asking, who is the client? Anyone who wants to embark on and do the job is considered as a client. And then we have usually, usually the workers who is actually doing the job. They are referred to as the contractors. But any job that is at the planning stage, they are all collectively referred to as designers. So any job before the actual construction starts, they are referred to as design work. Happy? The planning work and all those things are design work, a design job. 
So usually, usually, sometimes you will have different people doing that role, or you can have this design work and contractors the same person. If you look at simple things like changing the uh, the, the washers in the tap, yeah, so it ranges from everything from that level to the other. In that case, you would be planning, would you not? What time do you start? You speak to grandma, what time do I start? Uh, and grandmother says, oh, in the morning I have the kids, uh, school run, so don't come around that time. So all that arrangement that you are making with grandma is design work. But because you are the same arranging or planning and executing your uh, design as well as contract, it doesn't make sense. Sometimes you can have the same entity where the client decides that, I want to have everything under my roof. I have my own architects, I have my own contractors, uh, so I'm going to do the whole thing by myself. Yeah? So you can have one entity who does all the key three roles. I mean, you have to do that so far. Yeah? So it doesn't have to be separate entities. So critically, as I mentioned so far, three key players. One is a client who wants a job to be done or who actually executes the whole job. Then you have the planning stage and the execution stage which is done by designer and contractors by those two people. Now, there is a bit of a distinction here. The law, CDM 2015, says that where there are more than one contractor, you must now appoint a principal designer and a principal contractor. That's the big distinction, yes? Where if it is just one contractor who is doing the job, an example, like for example, changing the the the, the tap in the washer, a washer in the tap, just one contractor. But later, grandmother says, "Oh, darling, you're here anyway. Would you mind changing the tiles?" And you are saying, "Oh, I'm not a tiler, but I know a maid who does it for you." Now you have two contractors, which means that the law says you need to appoint a PD and a PC, principal designer and principal contractor. Happy with that thinking? Yeah? So the arrangement for a principal designer and principal contractor is where there's more, more than one contractor. Now, very, very quickly, people, let's go through each of those duty holders. Client. It could be a person or it could be a group of people um, who wants to undertake a project. It could be either commercial or domestic. Bit of a distinction here, if I may introduce you to, which is, say for example, you guys join force together and then you are telling the local council, you know, we will upgrade the whole utility services here. You from start to finish, you do it through this fact. In short, you are a client. Those guys who are managing the whole car park facilities, including putting the coin machine and including having CCTV and having the managing the whole car park facilities, although it is under network rail, but because they are managing the whole thing from them by themselves from start to finish, they are a client. Does that make sense? Yeah, so if you are embarking on the whole project by yourself, then you could be considered as a client. Now, the big difference with 2015 regulation is this, that client will decide whether a project succeeds or fails. Then we talked about the other person, which is a principal designer. For the one contractor, you have to appoint a designer. Who has to appoint a designer? The client. So we saw previously a distinction between accountability and responsibility. Happy with that? Accountability, you can't delegate. Responsibility, you can delegate. So a client may delegate certain things, but he is still accountable. So in terms of the appointments of a principal designer and a principal contractor, the client has to do that in writing. You know, while we're really looking at where you're going to be putting that in writing. So the client has to appoint a principal designer and a principal contractor in writing. Take note, guys, if he or she or that entity, which is called the client, doesn't appoint a PD or PC, by default, the client becomes a PD and a PC. 
So a principal designer is required because you are going to appoint other designers to do the job and you need to have a chief. You need to have one person who is overall responsible for the whole design team. For example, a designer could be an electrician who is designing on electric electricity bill. I'll give you a very quick example. There was one local authority who wants to work on a project. This is going back a few years. And they have appointed a principal designer and a principal contractor and the job was just about to start when due to some issues, I think financial issues, the whole project came to a standstill. Recently, the project was re restarted and the client went to the principal designer saying, oh, you know, you helped me with the design work. Yeah, you were the PD when we started this off. Can you be my PD? And for whatever reason, they did not agree. So the client decided to proceed with the project without a PD. There was a design fault. HSC prosecuted the local authority for the design work. And the local authority was saying, hey, hold on, I don't know anything about design work. I'm the client. But HSC said, show it to me writing. Where do you have the PD stipulated? So in short, guys, once again, if the client, the client must appoint a principal designer and a principal contractor in writing. So who is a designer? As I mentioned, designer is anyone who is actually, it can be an organization or an individual person, and they are involved in the design of work. It could be either permanent or temporary work, or it could be someone who instructs someone else to do it. So you guys can be a designer you're not doing it, but you're actually planning and arranging or instructing and taking on the responsibility, then you could be a designer. So any job that's been done before the construction work are referred to as design work. And the chief being the principal designer, so he has control over the pre-construction phase. We'll go into the pre-construction phase in a while. And has to be appointed in writing. Are we happy so far? Yeah? Now, moving on to these other uh, key duty holders are the principal contractor, who is actually personally responsible for the construction phase of a project. And he is the one who is responsible for other contractors, who is actually doing the job. So, I'm just giving you an overview regarding the key players. One, the client who wants a job to be done, or who is actually obviously doing the whole job for themselves. Then, people who are involved at the planning stage, they are called designers. More than one contractor, you need to have a chief, who is a principal designer. Then, the work itself done by the contractors, where you have where more than one contractor, a uh, principal contractor. Put that on one side, guys. Let's go to a project, any project. Can you give me an example of a project? Any project that you guys are doing? Re-roofing music. Yeah, so you're doing a re-roofing work. Yeah, that's a project. Before you actually start going up and then re-roofing, you will do some planning, would you know? Yeah? So, what, what, what would the planning look like? Yeah, so the client might be tendering for the job. Yeah, all that is happening in the planning stage. Specification of work. Specification of the job. Yeah, what type do you need? All that is planning phase. Now, think about from that level to a lower level. Say, for example, you are, I want you to change the fluorescent tube lights. Yes? So I am the owner of this hotel and I want you to change the fluorescent tube light. We will agree when you're going to be doing it. Agree? Happy with that? Yeah, so we're going to be agreeing the terms conditions. We're going to be saying when are you going to be starting? What type are you going to be replacing? Are you replacing light for light? Or are you going to be putting a sensor here? All that is planning stage. Yeah, so you're preparing for the job. Then you do the actual um, roof or you're actually changing the heat lights. Once the whole job is completed between the client and the contractor, you hand over the whole project back to the client. Yeah? So basically, 
any project from a small changing uh, attack right up to a big project goes through three phases of planning phase, construction phase, and completion phase. <coughs> to make the distinction, the best thing is that to look at the person who has overall responsibility for the construction phase is the contractor. Happy? And when the one contractor, you have a principal contractor. So that is the easy bit. Yeah? Construction phase is the contractor. Now, who do you think is responsible for the planning stage? Designer. So anyone involved in the planning stage, they are all referred to as design work. And as you can see, that, that is a designer and the chief being a principal designer. And likewise, the last bit, which is a completion phase, will still be the designer or principal designer. Happy with that, yeah? So the only thing that you're going to be thinking in the construction phase is a contractor. The first and the last would be the designer. Now, there are three key documents at each of those phases. And because this is a planning stage, the first document at the planning stage is the pre-construction information. So once again, guys, there are three key documents where you're going to be providing all the evidence of you managing the whole project. The first one being the planning stage is the pre-construction information. The second document, so to a great extent, who is in charge of pulling them all together would be the principal designer. The second document at the construction phase is quite straightforward, construction phase plan, the second document. And the third document? Yeah, so we, we covered that earlier, the health and safety file. Yeah, so the third document is the health and safety file, which we covered a bit earlier. So once again, people, there are three phases, and they are duty holders who manages the all the three phases and you need to have records and there are three documents the first document at the planning stage is pre-construction information managed by principal designer construction phase plan the second level which is uh, the building work by the principal contractor and the last one is the health and safety file back to the principal designer so if the question that is asked, the legal position is, who actually prepares each of those three documents? As you can see, the first one, pre-construction information by the principal designer, construction phase plan by the principal contractor, and a health and safety file by the principal designer. They are the one who pulls them together. So, as I mentioned, the question is, who actually is responsible to produce the pre-construction information? Principal designer. Who is responsible to produce the construction phase plan? Principal contractor. And the last one is the health and safety file would usually be the principal designer. Unless the principal designer decides to move on, then he hands the baton of responsibility to the PC. These are, yeah? So, um, usually, usually with the principal designer. So, responsibility is these key people. Who do you think is accountable to ensure all three documents are in place? The client. Happy with that thinking? Again, the client is accountable to ensure all three documents are in place. He is also accountable to ensure that the key players are appointed. And the appointment should be on the basis that they are competent to do the job. Are you happy with the word competent? We looked at SKTE. <coughs> The skills, the knowledge, the training and experience. He has to do his check to ensure that the people he appoints are competent. What happens if the principal contractor doesn't engage with the principal designer? This is a big difference. In, this is what 2015 is all about. 2015 CDM is saying that you must coordinate, you must communicate between the various people. Yeah? You can't just say that this is I'm working with you working in silo. You can't. You have to work because if you decide to carry on not following with the spec because you don't want to engage with him, 
then something goes wrong, the person will be, the planning, the, the designer will say, did I not tell you to do it this way, why did you not do that? Yeah, so the ball of responsibility will be on you for breaching the plan. The three documents, guys, are continuously evolving. Continuously, you have to upgrade it, yeah? So if you think that some certain things are not viable, then you've got to go back and then get an agreement from them. The best thing is to have evidence to show that you have actually notified them regarding the discrepancy or some issues that you're facing. Yeah? So keep records, uh, uh, which is to prove that you are <coughs> communicating with your, with your designers. The document which is managing the whole design phase or planning phase, we talked about which is the pre-construction information, which is required for all projects. But your pre-construction information could be as simple as a one-liner or could be at the back of your fact pack. Yeah, you agree your terms and conditions, when can I start, when can I finish, the specs, all that you are agreeing. So you need to, why is that? You need to plan it before you actually embark on something, yeah? Then the second document is the construction phase plan which is a principal contractor and how are you managing the whole thing during the construction phase and finally the health and safety file which you are putting it together to hand over to the client so the first two document will cease to exist after the project is completed is that fair enough? Yeah, job is finished you don't need those two, three docu two documents first two documents you shred it or you bin it when do you think you're going to be bidding the health and safety file? As long as the project is going to be there. So if you, for example, you have a health and safety file for Shard, as long as Shard is going to be there for 100, 200, 300, 400 years, you still have to maintain your health and safety file. And every time you're making changes, for example, you're changing um, the structure, you're building more floors, or you're changing the uh, the, uh, uh, the panels, all that you need to continuously update, update, update until demolition. Happy with that? Yeah? And the other thing is that this health and safety file, HSC doesn't want to see warrant based. They don't want all the details regarding all the ramps, regarding how did you build the jobs and what is the method segment, they don't want. Only what is critical for the client in the future. Only those critical information. Yeah? For example, in the building shard, if they want to replace a glazing, they need to know the spec of where you buy it from, which, which is the which is, which is supplier. All that needs to be in the health and safety file. So very quickly, people, as I mentioned, the first document, which is pre-construction information, you need the details regarding when is the project going to start, what does the client want, the client wants to build a football stadium, and you're all excited and you want to bid for the job. Turns out to be, it is a fiber size football team, a stadium. And you'll be thinking, bloody hell, that is not right, that I put all my effort into bidding for this job. So clearly, the pre-construction information needs to stipulate when they will be starting, how big is the project, how much money is then put aside, what are the resources, and even welfare facilities. So as you can see, this is pulled together, um, and the client may have this information already. And the hazards, generally ha general hazards or issues in the, in the workplace or on the site, on the, on the project. So three key things <coughs> the, regarding the project, which is a client's brief. How are you going to be planning and managing the project in terms of resources, welfare facilities, site security, and then the other bit about general hazard. So for example, if we are going to be doing digging up this place, you're going to be doing some groundwork, and later you want to uh, know that whether there is any uh, asbestos underneath, yeah, all that you can't be exposed to the client has to provide that information or make arrangement to do reasonable uh, due diligence. The second phase, which is a construction phase plan, and obviously at this point you are the person responsible would be the principal contractor. 
and you're looking at basically how are you managing the project at the construction phase. And the last document is the health and safety file. So health and safety file is required again where there are more than one contractor. So once again guys, the pre-construction information and the construction phase is required for all projects. Health and safety file is required where there are more than one contractor. So as you see that the more than one contractor comes into the scene few times. First one is, if you have more than one contractor, you must have a principal designer and a principal contractor. Now, we are looking at the fact that the, one of the documents must be in place, which is the health and safety file. Mm -hmm. It's a Victorian building and there is no health and safety file, then you've got to start the whole process by yourself by creating a pre-construction information. If a project that was built after the CDM was in, uh, came into the scene, there is a possibility that they would have a health and safety file. Agree? There is a possibility they would already have that. Then use that information to get all your pre-construction information. If you don't have that, you need to create that. And the designers, remember the job at the planning stage are the designers. They feed that information to the principal designer and then you create the pre-constructed information. You provide that information to the contractor who now has to create the construction phase plan based on what the client wants through the designer. You execute that job. But even from day one, you know that by the end of the project, you need to have a health and safety file. So from day one, you start feeding information, even for the design job and the construction job, critical information for the future for the health and safety file. Once the job is completed, you hand over the health and safety file to the client. Just one big distinction, guys. We talk about client is supreme. Client is overall responsible for the whole project succeeding or failing. He has to be responsible for health and safety as well. But a domestic client do not generally have any legal responsibility. However, if the client stipulates I have to build to that spec and if they get involved into the day-to-day -day operation, then that is different. But generally, generally, a domestic client will just get a contractor to do the job. Agreed. 99% of the time would be that. And you, a client doesn't, uh, in that case, doesn't have. So very quickly guys, looking at the duties of a client, he has to ensure the whole project is managed in a safe manner. He has to appoint the two duty holders, especially where there is more than one contractor. Who notifies F10? The client. So in the pre-construction information, he will stipulate that Joe Pablet or someone else will be doing the notification or he will say the principal contractor does the notification. So as long as everyone is clear who does the notification. And welfare facilities, again, responsibility would be the client. And again, client will be thinking, oh, I'm, I'm in China, how do I know about welfare facilities? As long as he got the competent person and then appointed them and made it very clear in the various documents who is responsible for welfare facilities, then it's, uh, it's quite clear who is actually doing the job. The client must allow sufficient time for all projects to be done in a safe manner. We talked about the fact that he's accountable for all three documents. And the most important thing is that he has to take, when I say he, I mean the client, must ensure that the people he appoints are competent to do the job. So just giving an overview, guys. Client Supreme has overall responsibility to ensure that the whole project is done in a safe manner, meaning put aside resources, get the right people for the job, and ensure that all three documents are in place. Again, there are so many cases, just May 20, uh, 2017, there was an incident where the client got other people, a principal designer contracted to do some job, 
right, as you can see, the client was prosecuted. 500,000, half a million pounds they had to pay. Again, you can see, I mentioned about the uh, sentencing guide earlier. Yeah, So it is depending on your turnover and how big the risk is. The client did not. So people, what we have been doing so far is the application. Yeah. How do you apply CDM? Now we are moving into the other thing, which this is where the gray area comes, where people think that notification and application, they are different things. So let's move into the notification. Certain projects, only certain great projects, you need to notify HRC. What do you mean big? Big means if the project is anticipated that it will last at least 13 working days. So think about it like one calendar month, yeah? So if a project lasts about that 30 days and there are 20 workers at the same time working, then it is notifiable. You have to notify HSC. Why? It's, not, it's such a big project, yeah? So, for example, you have the, I mentioned about the Thai League of My Toilet and some domestic works, all that, if it is not, doesn't fall, it could last, say, for example, 40 days, but there is only two persons working there, it is not notifiable. It has to be 30 and 20 people at the same time. Clear with that? At any, yeah? Now, sometimes you don't fall under that category, but if a job exceeds more than 500 person days, so even if you are working, say for example, 40 days and you are using 15 people, but collectively if they are working about 500 person day, then you have to notify. What does a person day mean usually, however, that your one day looks like? Yeah, so for example, if you are working in 6 hour or 8 hour, that's what a day means. A day also can be three hours. For example, you guys wanted to do some work, do some work for me, an attic conversion, and you can do it only on a Saturday from 12 to 4 o'clock, for example, and that's your day. Yeah? Then, a person, that is your one day. And if you're doing that over long weekends and weekends and collectively you're exceeding the 500 person day, you need to notify. So two criteria. 30 and 20 people at the same time or the whole project lasts more than 500 person day then you have to notify HSC so the question is when do you notify HSC? Well, that when. when? When do you notify? Before you start. But sometimes there's a possibility that you'll be notifying after the project starts. Absolutely. Yeah, you did not anticipate that it will last because, say, for example, grandmother wants an attic conversion done, and then you do one of the attic, and halfway through, you're almost completion, and grandmother says, Oh, can you put an ensuite as well for me? And you know, Oh, now this is going to exceed. So any time that you anticipate, then you need to notify. That's the key word, anticipate. It's preferably before you start the project and you know what the job is. So even if it is not, you have to uh, comply with CDM, but if it is, then you have to notify using the form F10. Earlier we were looking at a bit of a discrepancy between the other form. So F10 is the form that you're using. Uh, who notifies? The client. Again, you may be thinking the client is in Nigeria. How would the client do the F10? The client will have the on the right people, yeah, uh, and then make it very clear in the uh, in uh, the pre-construction information regarding who is going to be doing the notification. And again, there is not relying on the shoulders of a client, not so much a domestic client. We covered that already. Yeah, domestic line does not. So who do you think will be notifying? In that case, would be the contractor. Happy with that? And the F10 document people must be displayed on site. 
So guys, this we, we've been looking at CDM 2015. I just want to recap what we have just covered. The key difference is application and notification. Yeah. In terms of where does CDM apply? Every project we saw, yeah, whether it is big demolition, big construction work, right up to painting and decoration, even changing a tap um, or um, changing light bulb, CDM applies. But in terms of the paper uh, documentation, the processes, for small job we looked at so far as reasonably practical. Less small job, less paperwork. More jobs, more paperwork, and more detailed planning and, um, and uh, undertaking the job. So CDM applies everywhere. And application means that for, um, before you embark on, on a job, you've got to plan it properly. And they are the planning process, whether I want to change the light bulb, you think you'll be thinking, when do I do it? Do I do it after the working hours and when there's no one here? All that is planning an agreement with the client, all that is planning job. And that job, way before you embark on actual work, is called design jobs. Yeah, they are all design work. And they are all designers. Then, based on what you have agreed, you are going to be executing it, which is the contractors. And then finally, completion, you hand over the whole project back to the client. So those are the three phases. De planning, constructing, completion. And there are key players within these phases. The first one is you have the designers, and if you have more than one contractor, you need to have a principal designer. Construction phase, where there's more than one contractor, you need to have a principal contractor meaning a chip, and finally the completion. And we also talked about the three key documents. The first section, which is the planning stage, pre-construction information. Second, construction phase, plan, and then finally the health and safety file. So to get our head around, the middle one is where the responsibility to prepare the document would be the principal contractor, whereas the first one and the last one would be the principal designer. So that is, in a nutshell, what um, CDM application means. And then the other thing that we've got to be thinking about is some jobs, big ones, we need to notify HSC. What does that look like? A project that lasts for about 30 working days, 30 days, and 20 workers working on a project, then, ooh, this is a big one, needs to be notified. But even if they don't fall under that category, if that job lasts for more than 500 person day, then you need to notify. How do we notify? We do that using the form F10, and they're all done electronically. And even the F10 earlier that you mentioned about this document, they are continuously evolving. So even after you have notified and things are changing, then re-notify. The best thing is to, you need to do it electronically. Yeah? So update HSE to tell them what ha what's happening. So F10 is a document that you are completing and notifying HSC. Uh, and who is the one who is notifying? The responsibility lies with the client, but the client might delegate it, and the best thing is that have it recorded in one of the three documents. So that, in a nutshell, is what a CDM 2015 is all about. Happy guys. <laughs>